Nadine Bourgeau, Welcome to Shnikaz, Georgian Island, and Donjaba, Anishinaabe Clan Dao. Hello, everyone. My name is Haley. My spirit name is Wabgun, and I'm from Georgian Island First Nation. I'm a cultural resource advisor for Nogdwen Wapanojiag Child and Family Services in the Central Region. And today I will be sharing with you some of my teachings regarding hand drumming. Um, I'm just going to start off by doing our um, normal openings. So I'm burning some sage here to start us off with a smudge um, that will help us start off in a good way to bring open minds and um, to help me uh, in my teachings uh, with you today. I always smudge my mouth lots um, when I'm going to be doing lots of talking or singing to help my voice. And I'm going to smudge my drums that I'll be talking about today. So I'm going to start off with an opening song. This song is an acknowledgement song. It was taught to me and Hillary, my coworker, um, by Shannon Paul. This song um, can be sung at an opening or to acknowledge somebody for something specific at an event or a ceremony. Um, so I'm going to start off with that. So you go ahead. So now that we've started off uh, in our good way, I'm going to start by sharing with you um, a creation story of the drum. So this story was passed down th through many different storytellers and elders and knowledge keepers, um, but I um, know of it being passed down through John Rice to Kathy Absalon, who then told it to Shannon Crate, who told it to me. So a long, long time ago, there was a war between, between the Ojibwe and the Sioux people near the area of what is now the U.S. and the Canada border. The Ojibwe people were losing, and our territory kept getting pushed back further and further by the Sioux. The Ojibwe people were not warriors, so they didn't know how to fight, and they were losing. The women in the communities at this time held great political power, and so one day, the men went to the Council of the Grandmothers. They went to the Grandmothers and they said, we want your permission to go to war and to help our people. 
They need help and we need to help them fight. The grandmothers met about it, but with great reluctance, but feeling like they had no choice to. The grandmothers had a hard time deciding because we weren't warring people, but they decided to allow the men to go off to war and help fight against the Sioux people. And they did. They fought for a very long time, for many, many years, until they retained their boundaries. When they finally had retained their boundaries, the grandmothers told them, okay, that's enough now, stop. But when they finally had their boundaries, the grandmothers, they kept trying to tell them, but they just didn't want to listen. This, by this time, they had enjoyed the fighting and they didn't want to stop. But they were now missing from their communities to carry out their responsibilities and take care of their families and their community. The grandmothers kept telling them, that's enough now. We have our boundaries. You need to stop. Please come home now. But they didn't listen. So the children started begging the men to stop because of the great turmoil their communities were in because of this great war. The children tried to tell them to come home, but they still wouldn't listen. Until one day, a little girl said to her mother, I need to talk to Creator. I need to ask Creator how to stop this war. How do I talk to Creator? And she said, well, you're going to have to ask your grandmother. The, grandma the grandmothers carry all the knowledge. So she went and asked her grandmother, and her grandmother said, oh, you want to talk to Creator, eh? Well, the best way to do that is to fast. You're going to have to go out on the land with no food or water, just your sema, your tobacco, and pray. That is how we communicate with the Creator, through prayer and our tobacco. You will go out and you'll speak to Creator until Creator speaks back to you, however long that may take. So early the next morning, before anybody woke up, she grabbed her blanket and her tobacco and she left the village. She found a hill far away, all by herself, and she laid her blanket down and began her fast. In the morning, her parents were very worried about her to wake up and see her gone. They were looking everywhere for her, wondering where she was, searching the whole village. But grandmother knew where she had gone. She told her parents, don't worry, I know where she is. She will be fine. So that little girl stayed out there for four days, seven days, 14 days, we're not exactly how sure, we're not exactly sure how long it really was, but they say she stayed out there for 28 days. They say that maybe because she stayed out there for one full lunar cycle. She held her tobacco and prayed every single day to Creator. And on the 28th day, Creator came. She had her vision. She was looking up into the sky and she could see an object coming down, falling, falling. And she was, she was wondering, what might that be? But she knew, she knew she had to put her blanket down. So she, she put her blanket down and it did. It fell right on to her blanket. She was staring at this, this object, this circular object that had just fallen and she was wondering, I don't, I wonder what this is. What could this be? So she asked creator, what is this that you sent? I don't know what this is. And then one by one, the seven grandfathers came to tell her. The first grandfather came and he said, Dewagen, this is a drum. The second grandfather came and told her what this was made out of. He said, this drum is made out of deer hide. This deer laid its life down for this drum, for our people. This deer teaches us true kindness and sacrifice to give its life for us, for this drum, for clothing, for our moccasins and our food. Always remember that kindness when we use this drum. The third grandfather came and taught her about the tree that's in this drum that's made to make this circle hoop at the back. It's usually made out of cedar. 
this drum is made with that tree of life, that tree of life that teaches us so much and how Creator originally gave it to us. Sometimes now you might see a drum with a plastic ring or hoop, um, but Creator originally gave it to us with that natural, that tree. The fourth grandfather came. He said, I'm going to teach you about the four circles of life in this drum. The first circle is, is the drum. The second is the men that sit around that big drum and play. They are the protectors of the drum because this drum represents life. The third circle is the women who stand behind the men and sing. And the fourth circle is the dancers and the community that surrounds the drum. So if you go to a powwow today, you will see those four circles of life. You'll see the, the men playing the big drum, the women standing behind singing, and um, that community and the, the dancers all surrounding. The fifth grandfather came and taught her about that heartbeat, the heartbeat of the drum. He sounded the drum for her to show her what it should sound like. Sounded like a heartbeat. That represents the heartbeat of Mother Earth. This drum represents that heartbeat of our Mother Earth, the heartbeat of our nation. This will keep our community's heart beating. This will keep us strong. The sixth grandfather came and he gave her instructions on how to take care of the drum. He told her to never hang it up on the wall. It's not meant for a decoration. It's, oh, it has a voice and it always, that voice needs to be heard to always play the drum, never forget to play it, to always place it down on a blanket or a bag when you're not using it. Um, you can find drum bags like this one or you can make one yourself, but to never set it down on its face, to always set it down on its bag or in a blanket um, with its face facing upward. And to make sure that it's always safe and warm and protected when you're not using it and always to treat it like we would treat our babies or our grandparents with love and kindness and respect. The seventh grandfather came and he taught her how to make the drum, how to put it all together and he gave her instructions on how she needed to take this drum back to the community and that it would bring peace and balance to her community. After the seventh grandfather left, she had just enough strength to chew on a little piece of cedar to give her enough energy to get back to her community. She needed to get back to her community to tell the people what she had learned and to bring the drum home to help the men get back on track with their real responsibilities of being the protectors of life and how it can be done with, with kindness. They were so happy to see her come back and they listened to what she had learned the drum brought back peace to the community. So that is the creation story that I have been shared with. Um, there are probably others out there. Um, and also there are also different drums out there. So every culture has their own drum. Um, even within our own indigenous communities, we each have our own different uh, style of drums. Haudenosaunee people have a water drum. It looks very different than these uh, hand drums, but it is also really beautiful and has its own story and teachings. Um, so I'd like to share with you uh, about my first drum. Um, so this is the first drum that I've made. Um, I made this drum when I was 13 years old and um, one of our teachings are that we gift our first drum. And I was always taught you gift your first drum and that you don't need to do it right away, just whenever it feels right to you. So um, some people make their drum right away, they gift it to someone and that's completely fine. Um, but I was always taught that when the time feels right. And so when I made this drum, obviously I still have it, I haven't gifted it yet. Um, I made it when I was young and 
I kept it for many years, and this was the first drum I played. It was the first drum I learned any songs on. And when I was about um, 16 years old, I decided to paint it. So some people will have paintings on their drums, and some do not. That's up to you if you want to paint something on your drum, if you have something special um, that you feel would want to go, that you'd want it to go on your drum. Um, and some people's teachings are you don't paint your drum. But I decided to paint mine, and when I did, when I painted it, I painted the story of the women in my family's spirit names. So I, my spirit name is Wabgun, so I painted a flower to represent my spirit name. I painted a little bee to represent my mom's spirit name, which is little bee, almost. My sister's spirit name is bluebird, so I painted a bluebird to represent my sister, Awashko Banashis, and I painted a rainbow to represent my Nana, whose spirit name is Rainbow Woman. And I'm not a language speaker, and I think I just pronounced that last name wrong, but I would love to be able to say my Nana's spirit name, but um, I'm not quite there yet. So when I painted that story on my drum, I knew that I couldn't just now gift this drum to anybody. Um, so one day, if I have a daughter, I think that that's who I would like to gift my drum to, um, because that would be another woman added to my family. So I haven't um, gifted it yet, and I think that that's completely okay. It's up to you when you want to gift your drum and when that time feels right to you. So when you make a drum, you are creating a life. You're bringing a new life into this world. Um, we make our drums out of hide and that tree life. So it is made out of living things. And when we put them all together, we're creating a new being. When we make a drum, it's become our responsibility to take care of that drum. Whether it's we gift, we're gifting it and passing that um, on to someone else to take care of, or whether it's us or, um, yeah, whether that's you taking care of that drum for the rest of its, its life. So once you do make a drum, it will go through a birthing ceremony before you can play the drum. So at the birthing ceremony, it's a very beautiful ceremony. Um, you'll, so when you make your drum, you leave the hide. So this is all hide tied the drum at the back. It's, um, it starts off looking like this and you cut around and around and around and around in a circle until it becomes a cord. And that's what you tie that drum together with. This one that I have is actually tied, it was tied with sinew. But it depends who you learn from and what they make it with. So when you tie the drum together, you leave whatever material you're using, whether you have this much left, this much left, or whether it's a piece hanging about that long, you leave it there until the birthing ceremony. That extra cordage represents the umbilical cord, and that umbilical cord will be snipped at the birthing ceremony. Um, so at the birthing ceremony, you'll have tobacco, and you'll have berries, and you'll have water, and you'll have people with their drums surrounding you. So you'll offer your drum tobacco. So you'll sprinkle your tobacco on top of the drum, like this. And that's an offering for that drum, for that new life. All the people that are at your, your birthing ceremony are gonna sta will stand around you and they'll drum and they'll sing a song, whether it's a special song to you or um, just a song that they've chosen. Uh, they will sing that song around and the vibrations from their drums will make this tobacco on your drum dance. So as you can see, it will start bouncing like this. So you, at your birthing ceremony, will get to just sit in the middle of the circle and watch. And you really pay attention to that when you're watching that tobacco dancing because you may see um, pictures or something that might mean something to you 
within that tobacco. And um, you can share that with the people that are at your ceremony after with them if you want, um, or you can keep it to yourself, but it's pretty beautiful. Um, and once you've done that song and your tobacco is sitting, you would gather the tobacco and put it into a piece of cloth or fabric. And I, I tie it to the back of my drum and I keep it with my drum for a while until it falls off and then that's meant to go back to Mother Earth. Um, after the tobacco, you will snip your umbilical cord. You will sound the drum for the first time in each direction. So you will face each direction. You'll give it a, a sound. I'm just gonna put my tobacco in here. And you will sound with the drum as well. So in each direction. And it feels very empowering and spiritual and you feel that spirit with you when you're doing that. Um, after you've sounded the drum, you're going to feast the drum. So you're going to give it the, that berry, that um, strawberry, that odamen, and you're going to rub it into that skin of the drum and you're going to give it some water and you're going to pour that water on the drum and, and rub the water in, in with the, the drum as well. And remember this, this um, is skin and it will absorb that and it does need it. It will dry out over time and after it's been birthed, you're able to play it. Um, but you also need to take care of it and feast it seasonally. So four times a year, give it that berry and that water again. Sometimes you might notice that the drum is starting to sound a bit pingy or high pitched and um, that might mean it needs some water um, or it may also sound dull. That might mean it needs to be warmed up by a fire or if you're in a pinch, your stove top um, and it will it should help uh, we also if it's getting dried out or sometimes it might start to crack along the edges if it's um, getting old um, some bear grease rub that bear grease on there um, to help and finally our songs so I'll share a couple songs with you our songs have many different teachings with them as well. We have many different kinds of songs for many different purposes, and they each have a story that comes with them, depending where they came from. Um, they, they always start with four honor beats. So you'll notice you'll, at the beginning of our songs, you'll hear for each direction and then everybody will join in together. Our songs are also sung four times through, again, for those four um, directions to honor um, the, everything that the number four represents. Um, we have honor songs for honor, for our honor songs. We have women's honor songs, men's honor songs. Um, and usually for our honor songs, you'll notice people will stand just to honor um, and pay that respect. Um, we have opening songs, we have um, closing songs, we have traveling songs. Um, our traveling songs are usually sung at the end of a, a ceremony or at the end of a gathering to send everybody off in a good way. They can also be sung at um, Sacred Fire for somebody who's passed on to send them off to the spirit world in a good way. Um, we have water songs. Um, there, there's tons of fun children's songs as well. Um, we have lots of lots of different songs, and they're all so beautiful. And they are passed on orally. Um, same with our stories. So um, they're not usually written down. They are passed down through. Um, each other. So that's pretty beautiful as well. So I'm going to share, um, I think I'll share the men's honor song and the women's honor song, and then I'll do a traveling song. So the, this men's honor song, and you might also hear many different men's honor songs and many different women's honor songs. And there's also the women's 
the strong woman song and the and the women's honor song. So there are many different songs. Um, but this men's honor song I was taught when I went to school and um, we had a class of about 15 of us and in our class we only had two men and so we were taught that the men would stay seated and the women would stand and we would sing this song to honor those men in the group and by the end of the year those two men would they felt strong enough and brave enough to stand and sing all of the women in the group the strong woman songs. So that was pretty beautiful. And that's my memory of learning this song. So I'll stand to honor all the men. We are So you might have noticed I did um, a call at the end of my song. Um, you will often hear us do those. They're a buffalo call at the end of our songs. It's um, kind of our way of clapping or acknowledging. Um, and at Powell, you'll hear a lot of those, those calls. So I'm going to sing the Women's Honor song now. The Women's Honor song was taught to me when I started working here at Nogtuan Lab in Ojiag by Hilary Claremont and Zygwan Benessi Charles. Um, they're, um, my, another, they're our other cultural resource advisors. Um, and they taught me this song and it's a really beautiful song. Um, usually they're, you call back with each other and you each do a lead, but um, I'll do it on my own today. Um, and you always, with our songs too, since they are passed down um, orally, we always want to acknowledge who taught us that song. If we know where it originally came from, that's great. Definitely acknowledge that. Um, and if we don't, then to acknowledge who taught it to you. So this is the Women's Honor Song. Hey. Okay. 
you bet. Okay, and so finally, I'm going to share with you a traveling song. I know a few traveling songs, and I've heard many. Um, I've learned two over my life so far, and I'm going to share with you today a traveling song that I was taught by Penny Trumbull. Um, she's from Georgina Island, in my community, and she taught me this song, and it's a really beautiful traveling song. It's very calming, and um, it will send us off in a good way. So, miigwech. So thank you so much for joining me today. I really hope you enjoyed my teachings that I was able to share with you. And remember, um, if you have a drum, don't forget to play it. Don't forget to use your voice. You don't have to have the most beautiful voice in the world to sing and drum. It's good for your spirit. And um, it can bring you a lot of places, and it has for me. So miigwech for listening, and see you again. Bye, my peace.